Hello everyone and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of Falcon 2024 here at the Aria Resort and Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, alongside my co-host and co-analyst, Dave Vellante. We've got a very good friend of theCUBE joining us for this session. He is Tom Etheridge, Chief Global Professional Services Officer here at CrowdStrike. Thank you so much for coming back on. Thanks, nice to be here, Rebecca. Dave, hey, Tom, good to see you again. again. So, for those viewers who, who have not watched all your highlight reels, tell us a little, just set the scene for us in terms of what you do as Chief Global Professional Services Officer. So at CrowdStrike, I run the global services organization. That includes uh, our professional services business as well as our managed services business. Really, we run the IR forensics business globally. We have uh, assessment and advisory services team. Uh, we do training and education specifically around the platform, but also around specific skills like threat hunting and incident response. Um, I also own our managed services uh, Falcon Complete business, our MXDR. So services, it's where, it's where stuff really happens. It's where you build loyalty. Um, I used to say rubber, rubber meets the road, I still say that. Um, but you're a product company, yep. and so, I'm always interested when I talk to executives who run services organizations at product companies, how that works and what the balance looks like. Maybe it's different in cyber, but I wonder if you could address that, Tom. So I think our job in services is to really focus on two things. Uh, one is the customer. Uh, our job is to make sure that we're helping the customers stop breaches from happening in their environment, whether we do that through effective incident response and forensics investigatory work, or we do that through advisory and assessment and uh, delivering some of the cybersecurity consultative uh, experiences to help customers get better at both detecting and responding uh, to incidents that they have in their environment. Um, we're really focused on the customer, delivering that value and driving uh, the platform uh, into those accounts so that they get the value of not just the consulting work, but a solution that's going to protect them long term. So it's obviously not a big part of the P&L by design. Um, so what kind of freebies can the customer <laughs> take advantage of? Uh, freebies, um, we publish a lot of blog material, a lot of content about the things that we are uncovering in our investigations, about what we see in the threat landscape, as well as um, what we typically advise customers on in terms of preparedness and response related activities. So it's a lot of free consulting that we offer to all of our customers in that regard. Well Great. I definitely want to dig into what you're, what you're finding, but first I want to ask you about this, this area, this category that CrowdStrike really pioneered, the managed detection and response. And this is really where the company's roots are. Can you talk a little bit about how this has shaped the company's uh, outlook and mindset in terms of how you, how you consult with customers. So this started actually in professional services, um, the managed services um, uh, Falcon Complete part of our business. Um, one of my incident response directors after about 14 lost weekends in a row came in and said, I don't think I, I can do this anymore. And we sat down and said, what's, what's at the root of the problem? And really there are a couple of couple of areas we dove into. One area is that a lot of organizations and victims out there, they knew they were having a problem and they were working within the confines of their organizational structure and the tooling that they had to try to mitigate that attack from having a big, uh, big impact. And we would get the call on Friday after a week or more of work and where they couldn't stop the attack and we would go in and deploy our tooling and we would deploy the expertise to actually take action on behalf of the customer. So we said, how do we operationalize that in a managed services capability? And thus we, we started building out our MDR. So the, the purpose of our MDR is to really monitor 24-7, 365, on threats that are occurring on first party data. First party data for us is uh, identity, uh, endpoint, and cloud. Um, triaging, incidents that we see in the environment very, very quickly. Um, we talk about the threat report. I'm sure Adam has probably talked about it. Breakout times very, very quick. You know, we're seeing 62 minute breakout time. So being able to triage and understand an incident very quickly is important. 
but more importantly is actually remediating that incident. So taking the corrective action on the first party data and structure so that you stop the attack from progressing. And that's really what our MDR is capable of doing. Wow, I mean, picking up here. It sure yeah, is, You were yeah. talking <laughs> earlier about, well, you know, getting it deep into the, the program, but it really is, is hopping here. Tom, I want to ask you about, I mean, every person on the planet is or should be thinking about, how do I apply AI to become more efficient? Services is obviously a great example of where you can continue to automate and, and raise the bar. Almost a step function now is, is in front of us. How are you thinking about applying automation to the next level and AI to your business? On the MDR side in particular, we've, uh, we've been leveraging uh, Charlotte and a lot of the tooling that we, we've built internally to take advantage of uh, speed, increasing the speed in which we're able to triage incidents, to contextualize incidents with the intelligence that the company produces, um, and to be able to build and automate some of the run books that the team has built around remediation in particular. So really taking advantage of those capabilities to make uh, more efficient and uh, speed up the time we're able to actually triage and remediate some of these incidents at scale. That's on the MDR side. On the consulting side, we are taking full advantage of what we've built into the product and what we've announced this week in terms of incident workbench capabilities that exist in the product today to uh, make the analysts that are doing this investigatory work much more efficient. And doing that at scale, uh, we even talked this morning in our uh, one of the keynotes about the incident workbench and being able to uh, have multiple analysts working the same incident but be able to collaborate online in the platform. So really powerful capabilities around automation, uh, integration, improving communications, and leveraging the powers of AI. In your service organization, what what are the types of people that you bring in? What are the skill sets? Who, who are you hiring in that organization? We, uh, in our advisory practice as an example, we're pulling in some uh, former CISOs and uh, folks that work in, uh, have worked in the security function, directors of security, to help uh, organizations understand you know, what they need to be thinking about from a regulatory and a comp compliance perspective, as well as from a cybersecurity perspective. On the incident response side, we, are, we have a very robust internship program, so we, uh, we recruit from some of the top universities uh, in the states and abroad, uh, run them through an eight to 12 week program uh, where they get to see all of the types of services that we uh, deliver, uh, and then they can pick and choose really what they want to focus on. Uh, we bring them on board, we have a pretty good uh, success rate of pulling interns through. We, we recruit some of the top uh, incident responders out there, people that have great systems uh, engineering and architecture backgrounds, folks that uh, understand data uh, and understand how threat actors uh, are working in the environment. What about non-traditional backgrounds too? Because we've had a number of guests talk about how you, you really need people who understand humans, understand their foibles, can, can sort of work backwards from the social engineering aspect and understand the kinds of mistakes they would make wittingly or not. Yeah. Uh, and, and really have to think like a, like a criminal too because there's, there's that kind of understanding of manipulative behaviors yeah. that, that, are, that are the way our adversaries think. Our, our red teaming uh, capabilities on the services side, we have folks that are very adept at uh, social uh, engineering, uh, so they're pretty good at being able to, you know, use kind of the some of the psychological tools and use the uh, interactions, social interactions, to be able to convince organizations to either give them access or you know open up uh, access. And we're using some of the AI and some of the toolings that we're building on the red teaming side as well, uh, really building some robust capabilities around. You know, how do we build that into some of the attack uh, capabilities that our red team is leveraging? Do, do people in your organization name these bad guys? The, the Kalimas and Th the... That is, uh, the... That is our, our uh, SVP of uh, Threat Intel, Adam Myers. That's his group. He does ask for support in naming the threat actors. All right, so did you guys know what a, a Kalima, I don't know if I'm saying it right, did you know what a Kalima was No, before? I don't, well, no. Do yeah, you know yeah, what it is? No. It's like a mythical figure. It's okay. very popular. It's like a winged animal. All right. And it's very popular in North Korea. So it's actually, uh, okay. actually quite clever. 
You know, yeah, so, okay. no, they're very imaginative yeah. and creative names. Yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> they're fantastic. Yeah, so that's you. You need those kind of people in your team we, too. You need those English literature. We, we really try to humanize these threat actors because, um, you know, like Adam has said m multiple times, you don't have a malware problem. You have a, you know, a, a threat actor problem, right? Right. Uh, there, there's there are humans behind these uh, threats, and I think you know, what we've been reporting this week with uh, famous Kalima and some of the identity. Uh, insider attacks that we're seeing in the market. That's been pretty impactful over the last you know, uh, 60, 60 plus days. And that's where we were teasing Adam's uh, podcast. Adam, and I'm sorry, I, I don't know his uh, podcast partner, uh, but they did the, you know, the After Dark podcast last night, and that was one of the things they showed, and they showed it in the keynote mm -hmm. today, you yeah. saw it, where these insiders were getting access. It was just insidious and amazing, you know, real world examples of how relatively easy it is to circumvent the protocol. Remote work has opened up uh, the aperture for threat actors to, to really uh, take advantage of uh, the hiring process and recruiting and pull people into the organization without uh, the requisite checks and, and balances that probably existed when you had employees coming into an office and sitting down with HR for their onboarding. So um, it's, it's amazing to see how, how pervasive that problem, I think, reported today, it was about 150 uh, impacted companies that uh, the services and Intel team have been uh, communicating out to through law enforcement. To and really brazen, of course, the, like I say, these were examples of, of actually North Korean individuals, young people that had clearly had technical backgrounds mm -hmm. that were gaining access to, to laptops and then obviously were credentialed, well, come on in. And, <laughs> and But what strikes me is okay, that's really brazen. But again, you could have somebody internally is just a criminal. Disgruntled or, yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. That, so. and, but then, I mean, these are some pernicious examples, but then there's some business email issues too that you're seeing a lot of right now. Tell us a little bit more yeah, about that. Well, one of the things that we've been talking to our partners about, uh, law firm partners and insurance partners about is that the, the concept of a business email compromise has been uh, kind of like compartmentalized to uh, somebody gains access to uh, a user's inbox or email uh, and then they attempt to extort uh, or defraud that organization through uh, some kind of uh, payment request. Um, in our interviews with folks that are reaching out to ask for support in these cases, one of the things we've been uncovering is that there's certainly cases where somebody will click on a phishing uh, you know, link and, and open up the aperture for access into the environment, but we've been saying for over a year, threat actors aren't breaking in, they're actually just logging in. They gain access to a stolen credential, they access the environment, they happen to be able to get into somebody's inbox, and then they carry out these business email compromises. So one of the threads we pull when we're talking to these victims is, do you have a business, e you may have a business email uh, impact, but you may have an identity impact that you need to really investigate. So we've been talking to a lot of victims about their identity uh, infrastructure, the, you know, what kind of visibility do they have, uh, are they managing identities properly? Do they understand what identities may have been compromised or available for purchase? And those are areas we focus in on when we're doing a lot of these investigations. And it's not your business, but I heard talk last week, actually Larry Ellison on stage was saying, we're going to get rid of passwords. Passwords are dumb, it's ridiculous. You know, Safra they Katz. They are, I hope said, that they do. He said, Safra Katz doesn't ask me for a password, she just knows me. Yeah. My son knows me. <laughs> we're going to get rid of passwords. He sounded like Trump. We're going to get rid of the debt in eight months. But, so, but, but it, will we ever get rid of passwords? I, I maybe not in my, uh, my career, what's left of my career here, I don't, I don't see us getting rid of passwords. I think, you know, with multi-factor authentication, which is a challenge for a lot of organizations mm -hmm. still, um, but being able to roll out additional kind of capabilities to re-authenticate or challenge, you know, challenge a user to make sure that they are who they say they are. Uh, I think last year when we were talking, it was, uh, it's not uh, trust then, uh, verify then trust. Yeah. It's now we got to get back to more like trust then verify, uh, right. verify then trust. Right. So it's really something we're focusing in on. We have a lot of conversations with victims about managing identities and credentialing a lot better. 
Um, you see situations where you know, they say they have a password management policy, they, they say they have uh, all the rules in place and good controls, but a lot of these organizations manage by exception. So for every you know, 500 users in an environment, there's always a handful of people that have an exception to the policy, and threat actors love those exceptions. That's where they live, that's where that's they swim. That's where they live. Yeah. Um, we had one victim uh, some time ago had told me, that's not the intent that they issued that credential for the, the th that the threat actor took advantage of, and the threat actor doesn't really care what the intent of the credential was, they just know what they can do with the credential. We, we say it's like, we gave you card key access to uh, your office, uh, and, but we, when we gave you the access key, we actually gave you access to everybody's office. Um, you wouldn't know unless you walked around swiping it on everybody's office, but you know, that's, a lot of these credentials are privileged and they just open up the aperture for access to and too much is, stuff. And this is in a customer base that's, that's pretty well established. Sophisticated, pretty yeah. Large, it's pretty sophisticated. But you guys indirectly do a lot of business with small businesses. You know, you got partnerships with Dell. And small businesses, they don't, I mean, they don't even think about these things. And now maybe they're not as, as rich a target, but there's a lot of them. There are so a lot of them, they, you, sure. if you if you can If you can get money out of them, they, it scales. Our, our job is to make sure they don't get breached again. So we <laughs> try to do our best to make sure that they, they take advantage of what we can offer, not just from a services perspective, but from a product perspective, and we, we see a lot of great adoption of the platform, even in the, the small to mid-market accounts. Excellent, well, Tom, always a pleasure having you on theCUBE, thanks so much. Thank Appreciate you, Rebecca, it. thanks, Dave. A great Appreciate conversation, it. pretty scary, but a great conversation. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante, keep it right here on theCUBE, we'll be back with more of our live coverage of Falcon 2024. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis.